everyone, I'm back and I'm blonde, which somehow makes me feel more qualified to talk about how to do a basic trip to Europe. And when I say basic, I really mean anyone that's in the position to do an extended trip to Europe or another continent after college is very lucky, should be very grateful, is privileged to do so. But I know this is the time of year that people are graduating, thinking about doing this. No matter what situation you're in, I know planning an extended trip like this can be stressful even though you're literally planning a vacation. It can just be very nebulous in terms of where to start how to make sure you're getting the best deal, all that good stuff. So I want to make sure I take you guys through every element, top to bottom, of how to plan this. First off, I want to introduce you guys to today's sponsor, which is going to be Skillshare. I figured if you're adventurous enough to wander around Europe for a month, you're probably adventurous enough to want to try to learn some new skills. And that's why I wanted to give the first 500 of you to click the link in the description a free two month trial to 25,000 plus classes that Skillshare offers. Especially if you have some downtime before you head out on this trip, they have classes to learn Spanish in preparation for your trip. They have photography classes so you can get those Euro picks nailed down. They have meditation to keep you calm in the midst of things. I even found courses the other week about how to travel around the world world for cheap and how to plan a gap year for cheap. It's basically like instead of me giving you guys this advice from my personal experience, it's actually qualified professionals that know what they're doing giving guys the tips and tricks. So they have everything from design to business and coding. There are already 7 million people using the platform and it's really, really affordable once you're off the free trial, only 10 bucks a month and a premium membership gives you unlimited classes. So you'll never run out of things to do to keep your mind fresh post-college. If any of you are worried about that, it's real. So like I said, link in the description to try out Skillshare, but it's limited to 500 people. So make sure you get down there now and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this. All right, jack it off because we're getting into the real stuff here. And it's hot because California is finally getting into warm weather. So step number one on your Euro vacation, pick who you want to go with. Easier said than done, honestly, this can be tricky. Think of people you've traveled with before and you trust that are easygoing, slash just pick people who you don't think you'd get sick of after a month. That could be one person, that could be solo. It honestly might be safer to just go alone because you know you'll never get tired of yourself. You can always meet people along the way, but figure out who you're going with first, lock it down because you do not want flaky people coming in and out like, oh wait, I wanna join and then they back out. Number two, pick the season. Most of you are probably thinking summer because it's the kind of post-grad season slash if you're already in the working world when you get most vacation time usually. But if you graduate early or if you start your job late in the fall, those shoulder seasons in the spring and the fall are way cheaper to travel and it's also way less crowded. Number three, and I'm going chronologically here just FYI, what date range is possible for the group. So what's the very, very earliest you could leave and take a flight and what is the very, very latest you'd have to get back? Take into account if it's going to take you time to move out, if it takes you time to move into the new living arrangement you're going to have post-college. Think of all that and get a solid range, like a maximum possible range. That initial international flight getting to Europe and the one coming back are going to be most expensive, so give yourself freedom to find the cheapest departure date over a, a longer window. Number four, figure out your entry and exit points into Europe. Flights within Europe and trains within Europe are so cheap, I would not worry about where you end up landing first off. If it's Iceland, you can take an easy flight to London for like 50 euros or pounds. If it's Rome, that's a great starting point. What I'm saying here is the first flight you wanna book is that initial and final leg, finding the cheapest points. Number five, the flight apps and sites that I'd use to determine the cheapest entry exit points are Hopper, Google Flights, Scott's Cheap Flights, Skiplag, and Skyscanner. Really quickly debrief on all of those if you're not familiar with each one. Hopper is good for right now. So before you actually book the tickets and you wanna figure out when are the cheapest dates, you basically put in your departure point. So for me, like SFO or San Jose and where you're headed to, and it'll give you alerts to say, hey, your flights are probably gonna go down and become cheaper, wait to buy. Or hey, your flights are just gonna keep getting more expensive by now. And that way you'll have peace of mind knowing that you booked it at the right time to get it at the best deal. Google Flights is my favorite app because it allows you to book and figure out multi-city trips. It's not super convenient if you book a round trip to Europe. For example, if you go from New York to London and then you end up on your Euro trip closer to like Hungary, you don't wanna have to get back to London to get back to New York, if that makes sense. So Google Flights is great for those multi-city trips, um, plugging all those in. 
and it also does the tracking function similar to Hopper. Skip Lagged is actually a site that got sued by United for how good it was at finding deals. Um, it's a little complicated to explain how it does it, but basically it'll find flights that have cheap layovers that you can take advantage of. So if you want to learn more about how it you know, connives those cheap prices, you can Google it. Scott's Cheap Flights is similar to Hopper. This one is pretty unique and it does the work for you of finding out the cheapest places to, to enter and exit Europe. So play around with it, see what is cheap for the dates you want to go. Um, it'll tell you if there's a really good bargain one week. You can pay for a subscription actually that tells you a bunch more cheap flights. And then Skyscanner is the, the flight app you want to use when you're in Europe, booking those short little flights from, you know, London to Berlin or Denmark to Italy or whatnot. Once you have booked your initial flight and your very last flight, now you get to configure what you want to do within that. So within your month long or two month long. And by the way, if you're going to go to Europe, I suggest doing at least two weeks just because the flight is so long getting over there. You might as well plug and stay for a little while longer than you would usually do. And you'll never have the ability to take such extended periods of PTO. So two weeks minimum, like I've had people go for like two or three months that loved it. So give yourself a lot of time to plan the stops in between point A and point B. You might have some cities you've always wanted to go to, like Barcelona or Prague, or have always wanted to go to the Amalfi Coast. If you don't have cities like that, ask friends or people you know of that have studied abroad. They'll give you the most incredible niche spots, the spots that aren't just Paris or London, like the more beautiful like Annecy, France, or Cassis in the south of France. I think France is the most magical place in Europe, but that's no secret based on my Instagram. So for having trouble deciding, between places. I actually looked to travel vlogs to decide between those stops, just seeing what looked, you know, maybe the most fun or had the most to do. And then once you know the general spots you want to go within Europe, figure out when you want to be where. Um, this can be tricky. The first way I'd, you know, break it down is, is there some spot you need to be at in a certain date? Is there a music festival in London on July 24th you have to be there for? Is there a specific place you want to be for the 4th of July? Or you probably want to book the bigger, more popular cities on the weekdays and the smaller cities on the weekends so you balance out the busyness. But figure out if there's like tentpole dates you have to be in certain places and that can help you figure out when to be where. And then for me, the most concerning part was like, how many days do I need in each spot? So there's a couple of articles and resources I checked. Um, they're linked down below for the article. Reddit is a good source to check. TripAdvisor is a good source to check. Baseline, I would say book every spot for a minimum of two nights, just because if you come in, you know, Thursday night, and then you have to leave Friday, it just doesn't give you a lot of time to like settle in, you know? So you wanna have two nights. That way you don't have a day where, you know, you check out in the morning and then your next flight's at 9 p.m. You're gonna be walking around with your huge suitcase or your huge backpack all day. So minimum two nights just so you don't feel rushed is what I would say. Once you have how many days you wanna be there and a general path through Europe of where you're going when, um, you wanna make it pretty linear too, just cause it's a lot cheaper to go from like Paris to Amsterdam than it is to go from Denmark Mark to Italy, if you know what I mean. Three options to get within Europe. One trains, two flights, three buses. And that's my order of preference, actually. Number one, trains are great because they usually take you to the city center directly. Whereas a flight, usually those airports are further out of the city. You're gonna have to figure out the public transit to get in there. And if you're landing late, you don't wanna have to do that mental math and figure that out, especially with the language barrier. So I would say trains are get great because they're usually pretty central. You don't have to pay baggage fees. Some of those cheap European airlines charge you for your bags. So trains don't do that. There's like minimal security. I love looking at the countryside, it actually gives you a better view into what Europe looks like between the major cities. Last thing I want to say for trains is that you may be tempted to buy your rail pass. Do the math. Uh, try to book all of your trains, you know, one by one. Um, add up the total and see if that's cheaper than a Eurail pass. It was for me. I think generally Eurail is better if you have a longer trip, like more than a month. So test it out. Um, it might not be a great deal actually. The second option of flights uh, that's where you want to use Skyscanner, and flights are good if you're going a little further of a distance, you know, if you're going from London to like Barcelona, you're probably going to want to take a flight for that. And you can get some pretty cheap deals, sometimes it's cheaper than trains. And then third option of buses, Flix buses are pretty cheap, um, will take a little longer, but if you're trying to be affordable, buses are probably the cheapest option here. Okay. We got through flights and transportation, now I want to walk through lodging and where you're going to stay. 
The options you have with lodging in Europe are one, hostels, two, Airbnbs, and three hotels. So hostels should be the first place you look. It is the true way you're supposed to backpack around Europe. Like that's the way our parents did it. In America, we don't really have hostels, so it's pretty unique. It's extremely cheap. I will say if you're traveling with a group, uh, this is where preferences and lifestyle choices come into play. What I mean by that is some people want to stay at a nice hotel and some people want to stay at the dirt cheap one. Usually it comes down to how you were raised. Like for me, my family would cram four people into a Best Western room and we'd sleep two to a bed. Like just get it cheap because our philosophy was, you know, you're gonna leave in the morning and come back at night. So you're not gonna be spending much time there unless you're staying at like a resort, you know, on like a tropical island, like generally hotel doesn't matter or lodging doesn't matter a huge amount. Um, so just keep that in mind. People might, you know, have their tendencies and preferences here, but I would suggest number one, hostels, because they are the most affordable option. Think about it. If you're in Europe for 30 days, if you pay 100 bucks a night for a hotel, that's $3,000. Um, that's a lot of money just to pay on the lodging. So hostels can range from being like 10 to like 80 bucks a night usually. Hostel World or Hostels.com are the resources you want to check for those. And read the reviews. See if it's close to the city center. See if it has air conditioning. See if there's a good subway nearby, if there's a kitchen. Those things may matter to you. So definitely read the reviews to figure out which one in the city you would like. But um, those are communal option, but you're coming from college most likely and you're used to that. So I'd stick to hostels, but Airbnb and hotels sometimes can be cheaper if you're uh, traveling with a group of two or more. Uh, I would do the math and I would check for every city pick out you know four or five hostels, pick out four or five Airbnbs, do the price comparison. Sometimes when you divide it up, uh, Airbnb can be cheaper or a hotel can be cheaper. And it is a nice break from the hostel life. You know, Maybe there's a laundry machine in there, you can do your laundry, you can just kind of rest a little bit more, have your private space. So maybe one or two of the legs you wanna book a Airbnb or hotel. I will say Airbnb has a horrific cancellation policy, so be warned. I might even choose a hotel over an Airbnb just for that purpose. You never know the weather conditions. You never know what's going to happen event-wise in that city to, you know, deter you from going there. So, hotels and hostels generally have better cancellation policies. And if you are going to go to a hotel, make sure to get your rewards points. That's kind of the only pro of a hotel is that, you know, you can get rewards points for staying there. And if you're staying for 30 days in Europe, you can probably get some good, you know, rewards points that way. So once you've evaluated all your options for each city in terms of what type of lodging, make sure you create a spreadsheet of every single arrival time that your bus or flight or train lands in the city because I've made the mistake before where I get time zones mixed up and I book the hotel for one night later than I should have, uh, especially with like overnight situations. Like just be careful and make sure you really understand which nights you need where. I clearly don't have time to talk about what to pack or how to prepare or what to do while you're in Europe. So give me a comment down below if you think I should do a video specifically on that kind of stuff or let me know what you want to hear from me about. I actually, I'm kind of running out of video ideas at this point. So I'd appreciate some recommendations no matter what, you know, topic they are. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next video and Kath are out.